I'm going to show you the game between Magnus Carlsen and Ariane Tari from round eight of Norway Chess. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do help us keep the lights on with a donation. Links down there. So in the first half of the tournament, uh, Magnus Carlsen defeated Tari in a wild game where Carlsen really took some great risks. Of course, he had the black pieces. In today's game, he had white and he could afford to play a little more calmly. And indeed, we have a very orthodox opening. It's a closed Spanish and here, instead of rookie one, the traditional main line, Carlsen played pawn to d3, which has become very popular over the past few years and is a very respectable way to play. And in fact, Carlsen very much likes this pawn structure, not just in the Spanish, but in the Jocopiano as well. So now that the e-pawn is protected here. Now white is threatening to take on c6 and take on e5, therefore b5 and bishop b3 and d6. Everything in order so far and because the pawn is on b5 that gives white a little something to bite on, a4. So black has to deal with this threat. So bishop d7 and c3, the usual move covering these squares and potentially perhaps allowing the bishop back to c2 if white wants it. Of course, c3 at some moment might prepare to play d4. Knight a5, putting the question to the bishop, should it go back to a2 or c2? Well, Carlsen chose to put the bishop back on a2, which keeps it on this absolutely superb diagonal. And Carlsen has actually had this exact position before against Ding Liren. And there Ding took on a4 and actually managed to generate enough play in the position. Um, although it does spoil black structure, in fact, it takes white some time to, to pick up that pawn. In the meantime, Ding managed to get enough play. But Tari didn't take on a4. Instead, he played c5. You could say a more orthodox continuation. Just bringing more pressure uh, or occupying more... Uh, well, giving black more control in the center, I should say. It's been a long day. Bishop g5. Well, you can see that now the d5 square after c5, d5 has been weakened. So it makes sense to perhaps eliminate that knight and perhaps later on occupy the d5 square. Castle's kingside and knight d2. And again, it's possible to take on a4, but rook b8. And now, of course, there's more pressure on b2 potentially after this, so it's definitely the time for white to exchange now that the rook has moved away, and that means the rook on a1 potentially could get a bit of action down the a-file. Rook e1. Could be that white is preparing d4. Uh, could be that Carlson just wants to play more slowly and maneuver the knight in the usual way round to e3 to gain more control over this d5 square and of course f5. Um, but I mean the position isn't so bad for black here. Um, I think knight c6 bringing the knight back into the center looks reasonable to me. Uh, but instead of knight c6, Tari played b4. And to my eyes, that looks strange because it gives away this c4 square. And Carlsen immediately put the knight in there. That was exchanged off. And you can see that just gives white even more control over c4 and d5. 
Atari exchanged on C3. So, yeah, the rook potentially can come come down here, but it's, it's not doing much. It, I think this is uh, more relevant to the position, the potential control of the A file. And here, Queen C7 from Tari, a uh, move that surprised me a little bit. Um, given that white's strategy is to play on the light squares, on c4, d5, and, well, eventually through to f7, then we know that Carlson wants to knock out that knight on f6 to gain greater control over d5. So why not put the knight back on e8? Now, the bishop could retreat to e3, and then... Well, either the knight could go back to f6 or perhaps to c7. I mean, white is slightly better there, but it's not so bad. Or if white exchanges, then at least that bad bishop has gone. Yes, the position is certainly more comfortable for white. But from a positional point of view, well, it's not, it's not so bad for black. But, well, when you have a, a slightly worse position, it's difficult to evaluate which position is is better in, in a sense for black when they're all a little bit worse you know so queen c7 and simple chess from carlson queen c2 and here again i i felt that tari was just too obliging he exchanged these bishops bishop on c4 is indeed very powerful but i thought it would be best just to challenge on the a file but bishop b5, and Carlson exchanged on b5, and then exchanged on f6, and played knight d2. Well, this is hardly an original strategy. It's simply very strong, however. We have a, a classic good knight against bad bishop position. So this knight is going to establish itself on c4, where it looks at that weak pawn on d6, and it has potential as we'll see, to spin round to the d5 square, depending on how black plays. And this is unpleasant. You can see also some control over the a file as well. And this is already, well, highly unpleasant for black. Queen c6, queen a4, white takes control of the a file. Knight c4, there we go, all as advertised, and the knight covers the b2 square, so no counterplay for black. Bishop b7, the bishop has to fall back just to cover the d6 pawn. But this is hardly very active. g3, absolutely standard. The king finds a safe square potentially on g2, so no back rank problems. And later on, could be that white wants to push with h4. Queen c8. Now... There's nothing doing for the queen for the moment on the a-file, but it's time to bounce it round to the king side. Queen d1. It needs to go on f3. g6, black can't do much. King g2, nice and tidy. Bishop drops back to f8 and queen f3. So, nice manoeuvre, just a little improvement of, of white's position. And you can see that one potential target is the f7 pawn if black is careless but it's just on a good square on f3 starting to look over at the king's side that really is white's ultimate goal here there are several weak points in black's position d6 f7 and, well, potentially the 8th rank as well. Rook b3. Attacking the pawn. That's covered very easily. Queen e6. And rook a7. So you can see pressure there. So that really has to be challenged on the 7th rank. Now, there's no real point in coming to a8. Because black will block again. So rook takes rook. Rook takes rook. But rook a1. Rook number 2 comes over. And now we can see Black's Dilemma. Basically that rook is going to enter somewhere on the A file. Could be A6, 
looking at that weak d6 pawn, it could be the 8th rank, and that is already highly unpleasant for black's king. And if black's rook covers, well, basically black needs three rooks in this position to cover on the 8th, 7th, and 6th ranks. But, yeah, I almost feel sorry for that rook or Tari's plight here because that rook simply cannot cover all the entry points. It's a miserable position for black to defend so passive. Um, Tari played h5. Well, who knows? I mean, white would always have ways to make progress, but uh, Carlson manages to exploit this move as well. It actually helps him to open up the king side. I mean, if he hadn't done that, then Carlson could potentially push anyway with uh, these pawns. But anyway, h5. Rook a8, king steps out of the pin, and now the knight spins around to the dream square, d5. Rook c7, knight d5, rook c8 covers on the 8th rank, but there we go, the rook just switches and now attacks on the 7th rank. It's really almost impossible to defend this position. Uh, rook b8 played. And now Carlsen starts the next phase. He's got his pieces in the perfect positions. So time to open the king side. h3 and now g4. So threat to take here. So Tari exchanges. And you can see that, well, it's just helped open up the h-file. That's the problem with h5. Um, and this pawn is going to g5 to support a knight coming into f6. Um, and that just can't be stopped. I mean, g5 would be really ugly. Knight e3 and well, so it's going to collapse very soon. Uh, rook d7 played. Rook a8. So now we're back to attacking on the 8th rank. And yeah, white simply wants to play g5 and knight f6. And very soon that queen will be able to switch over. Tari tried f6, but didn't really help. g5 anyway. That can't be taken because of queen f8. f5. And now the queen comes in. Queen h3 threatening a check on h6. Rook f7. And now Carlsen finished with a couple of nice tactics. Um, he said afterwards, well, it, it would have been more in the spirit of the game to, simply to play queen h4 and followed by knight f6 to win the game really without any tactics at all. But, well, it's hard to resist white's next move. Rook e8. Very fine. There's really no alternative to taking. If the queen comes back, then queen h6 check and queen g6. So queen takes rook, queen h6 check, king g8 forced, queen takes g6 check. If the bishop interposes, knight f6 forks king and queen. And after king h8, knight f6 anyway. And here Tari resigned. Queen g8, mate is threatened as well as the queen. And if rook takes knight, then, well, let's just take the queen. And in fact, even this position it, it collapses immediately because black's rook is trapped. Let's leave that final position on the board with the queen and knight beautifully placed together. Well, what... Uh, a wonderful positional game from Carlsen, and it's really textbook stuff. But it has to be said, Tari was very obliging in this game, far too cooperative. And I think, really, you know, we can see the difference difference in strength between the two players. Anyway, that win brought Carlsen into the lead because Firuzja 
only drew again I say only <laughs> he had uh, an interesting draw against uh, Caruana and then Firuzja lost the Armageddon game Caruana completely outplayed him so that means that with two rounds to go Carlson leads the tournament they have a rest day tomorrow and the next game is on Thursday <laughs> and Carlson faces Firuzja that's going to be an absolute cracker Thanks for watching.